Amen. All right, you guys, and with that, I get to bring up our speaker today. It is not me. Thank goodness, right? <laughs> See, that's what I was actually looking for. See, that's when you say it, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, just a little bit. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, yeah. All right, so <laughs> can you imagine? Anyway, okay. Um, but today we actually have, you may have heard him speak once or twice before, mostly just once. It is Brother Biceps. Dion Becker, our brother from the Southern Hemisphere, in his very tropical shirt. Yes, brother biceps. It's not going away, unfortunately. Um, but I'm also not going to stop going to the gym. So it's a win-win or win-lose, I don't know, something like that. Anyways, let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, for the message that you have put on my heart. Father, I pray that you will speak to your people today, Lord, whether it's encouragement that they need, whether it is a word from heaven, Lord, on a decision that they need to make. Father, I pray that you will speak to them today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys. So it is my privilege today to speak to you guys. And if you can't tell by the tone of my voice, I am actually very excited to be speaking. It's not just like this is just the sound of my voice. I'm a very calm person. So if you need me to be a little bit more upbeat, then I'm going to need a hand clap or a, an amen or a little wave. Whatever you can do, I'll take it. So we're going to be reading from... Uh, 1 Chronicles 12, verse uh, 20, uh, 32. From Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Now, if we've been talking about this message of, you know, becoming an Issachar generation, you know, and I, I truly believe that God is raising up a generation of Issachars in the time that we're living in. Because we need to understand the season that we're in, and we also need to know what to do as God's people. You know, and traditionally, we've heard Pastor Steve say this a couple of times now, but the church has been very bad in both understanding the times that we're living in and also knowing what to do. You know, like we've been doing, like, yes, we've been doing the mission field, we've been doing you know, church planting and all of that, but I think the effectiveness is just not quite there. You know, and when we go back 2,000 years ago to the day of Pentecost, you know, we entered into a new age on this planet, the age of the church. But what was the significant sign of the church back in the day? It was the Holy Spirit. They did not go anywhere without the Holy Spirit. Is that true of us as a church today? Is that true of us as Christians today? Do we truly know that the Holy Spirit is with us? Or do we just say a quick prayer and hope for the best? You know, <laughs> I've done that before, and it just doesn't work out. You know, and our text for today is found in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, where, where Paul begins to talk about what the last days will look like. You know, and many people have <laughs> very different ways of interpreting what it means, you know, to be living in the last days. Are we living in the last days now? You know, how many books have gone on sale that said the, la the last days was going to be in, to the two th in, in the year 2000, you know, like those <laughs> very next day, 50% off or I don't know, <laughs> something like that. But basically, that's, that is up for discussion and there are different theories about that. But what I know is true is that whether we are living in the last days now or not, we still need to be ready for the season that we're in, not the season that we're hoping to be in or would rather want to be in. Amen? You know, and last week we heard uh, um, Joseph talk about, you know, um, what the end time generation would look like and that they would be lovers of self and lovers of money. You know, today we're going to be talking about um, what the four characteristics of a, uh, a self-absorbed person looks like. And our key verse for today is in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 2. It says this, But know this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, and these are going to be our four points. Boastful, proud, abusive, and disobedient to their parents. So we're, you're already telling it's going to be a really uplifting message, right? Yeah. We'll, we'll get there. Promise you. <laughs> 
So the first one, boastful, you know, people who are committed to their own self-promotion, their own personal agenda. They're willing to exaggerate, overstate the facts, embellish a story that will, so that it will have a positive effect on his or her position or situation. You know, how many of us, you know, know people like that? You know, I, I, I know I have been that person myself, but it comes from a place of insecurity. It comes from a place of not knowing who you truly are. You know, but today, we have a name for that. When the truth is stretched and a lie is told to have a positive effect on a situation or position. We call that the mainstream media. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> but all jokes, all jokes aside, we call that situational ethics. Now, what is that? It's when we throw away fixed ethics and moral absolutes so that we can embrace floating ethics. Now, what is floating ethics? It's when it's, it's, it's flooded our culture, and it is embodied by this idea that says, I'm okay, and you're okay. You have your truth, and I have my truth. Now, back when I first became a Christian, I didn't know better. So I would go around, and I would just share, you know, like, oh, you know, this is amazing. Became a Christian. You know, I'm living this new life. And what's really, what, what, what I did back then was I would say, you know, I'd enter a conversation. I'd be like, you know, like, that's great. You have your truth, and I have mine. You know, I have my Christianity, and you have whatever you have. Uh, but just so that I don't step on any toes. Now, how many of you know that that is a very flawed idea? It just doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work is because it lives in this, it has its roots in this postmodern, you know, subjective truth claim that, you know, you can have your truth and I can have mine. And there are many roads that lead to God. It just doesn't work. You know, and what I can, what, let me see here. Yeah. In John uh, 14, verse 6, Jesus says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And Jesus also said in Luke 13, 23 and 24, Someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Now, what I, when I read that verse, what really stood out to me is the many will try to enter and not be able to. How are they going to try? What are they going to do? They're going to try and use philosophy. They're going to try and use their own reasoning, their own intellect. They're going to use situational ethics to kind of find a shortcut, find a loophole, and basically reason their way into heaven. That just doesn't work. And this leads us to our first fill in the blank for today. Jesus was clear that there is only one road to God. If there was another, God would not have sent his only son to die for us. You know, and we see progressives and secularists who are dedicated to dismantling the fixed moral truths and ways of life that is found in the Bible and that our society is built upon. You know, and this is ultimately going to lead us down a road of a moralist society and a lawless society. You know, and when we talk about this, we see it on the rise. Um, you know, it's talked about uh, you know, social media, the news. Like, you, we can never get enough of the fact that, you know, like, oh, my goodness, society is like, you know, just like going up in flames. You know, but we, have we ever stopped to ask, to what end? Why would the enemy want a world without morals and laws? I believe our answer is found in, in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse uh, 3 to 4. It says, Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy, the falling away, comes first. And the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. And the reason I believe that the enemy needs a world without morals and no firm laws is so that this man of lawlessness, this son of destruction, can come and set up his reign. You know, our current society didn't accidentally arrive at the place it is today. 
it's been a, it's been an orchestrated plan of the enemy, step by step, year by year, century by century, to create this path for the man of lawlessness to come, this spirit of lawlessness. You know, and that's where we can kind of like go back into this, like, oh well, who is it? Who is it going to be? Like, no, it's a, there's a spirit behind it that will that will leech on to whoever is not grounded in what the Bible says. You know, and the rebellion that it's talked about, it, it says it's going to be a, a society-wide turning away from God. You know, and God says that this, um, that the enemy already has in place, you know, this, like, um, this spirit of lawlessness. You know, and there are people, you know, who are, are, are who possess no fixed moral standards, they will, you know, they're kind of attracted to that way of life. You know, and it depicts people who live void of any standards, law, or a state of lawlessness. And the ironic thing is for me that people who, li who fit this description, you know, they refuse to live in, a, in the way that the Bible says because they see it as out of date and it tells people what to do. They don't want to be told what to do, all the while living as slave as slaves to this spirit you know and then we come back uh, come to the uh the second uh, characteristic which is pride you know and pride represents someone who's arrogant high and mighty possessed by people who believe that they have some kind of advantage over others whether it be intellectually or otherwise you know and they think that they then possess the right to tell people what to do you know, we have, for example, politicians telling parents to butt out because they know what's best for their children's education. You know, and pride can, you know, it, it can be said of pride that it's one of the biggest characteristics um, that is ruling the planet. You know, God says in Isaiah 5 verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. You know, the pride of the, of the intellect is a sneaky one because I, I, I believe that God gave us minds to think, to reason, to learn. You know, it has a redeeming quality to it, but if it is not submitted under God's authority, it will have a misguided outcome where you will be like, no, actually, this evil, you can see it as good, or this good, no, it's actually evil. It twists what th is already there. And then the third one is abusive or blasphemous. You know, and another characterization um, for this is, you can see it in the Greek, it's called blasphemo. And, the, and what that means is to slander, to accuse, to speak against, or to speak derogatory words uh, for the purpose of injuring or harming another. You know, this was also a word that was commonly used to signify people who constantly used profane language, foul language, unclean language, as though it were nothing. But it can also refer to the divine. Mostly people who uh, use words to debase others, you know, to debate or be insulting toward the, d uh, the divine. You know, and that's not just when we speak toward to other people in that manner, we're speaking Indirectly, we're speaking to God in that manner because I believe that we're all divine people in that sense, that God has given us his spirit, he's given us his breath in our lungs. So when we treat others like that, you know, God takes it personally. You know, and secular cul culture will claim to be sophisticated and forward-thinking with the ideas and the language they use, but the evidence actually shows that the language is being debased and emptied of its, you know, its valued uh, terms of like courtesy, manners, and basic respect. You know, our speech is a good indicator of what we're filling ourselves with. You know, and this leads us to our second um, fill in the blank, which is that language is spiritual because it flows from the heart. And I think the thing that people miss with when it comes to, you know, what's flowing out of our hearts is like, oh, okay, well, yeah, stop speaking in this way. Stop behaving in this way. You're being told what not to do, but you're not being told what you should do instead. You know, it, if you're going to stop doing something, whatever's lying dormant in your life is just going to take its place. If we're not proactive with our faith, 
with our relationship with the Lord, those things will just swoop right in. You know, Jesus says in Matthew 12, uh, verse uh, 34, you brood of vipers, how can you who say evil, who are evil, say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. You know, God tells his people in Ephesians 4, verse 29, um, do not let unwholesome words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good for building up others according to the need and the occasion, so that it will be a blessing to those who hear and then in um, brackets, you speak, who hear you speak, you know, because your voice does matter. But when we're afraid to speak up, we kind of silence ourselves. And then the fourth one, this one is a little tricky because I'm not a parent, but it's being disobedient to parents. Now, I've lived on the other side of that being a child of two parents. But what I've learned about this is, you know, the Bible um, has prophesied in 2 Timothy uh, 3, 3 verse 2 that parental authority in the home will be compromised. Parents will find themselves attempting to negotiate with their children rather than leading them as God has called them to do. You know, children are a gift from God, and, and as parents, we're, you're called to be faithful with that precious gift. You know, and already you have some, pe some parents who are hesitant to discipline their ch children because of all the lingering things that you hear out there talking about how parents turn on their, uh, children turn on their parents. You know, and the laws that are being put in place in certain states and things like that, you know, are actively trying to build a, to create a rift in the home. And we live in a time where parents must recover their God-given assignment as parents. You've been given the responsibility to raise them in the way that they should go. And the great thing is that the Bible promises that when you do that, they will not depart from it as they grow older. You know, and I can testify to that. You know, I, I was raised in a Christian household, and I, was pri I, and I see that as a massive advantage because sometimes, you know, like, you don't really realize what you have as until you kind of grow up and you start listening to other people's stories and what they've been, you, what they've been through, you know. And you might be the one that's going to break the curse in your generation, in your line. You know, that was my parents for me. They st they they decided up until here and no more. They they've drew the line, and because of that. You know, I can, I, can, I can only thank God for them because of that. And this brings us uh, to another fill in the blank. Your God-ordained authority in your home is not just a right. It is your God-given duty and responsibility. So then the question becomes, what can I do then to protect my family, my heart, my eyes in these times? You know, there's seven action steps, I believe, that we can take to guard our hearts, our eyes, our ears, and our families. And the first one, and this is also a fill in the blank, we have to ask ourselves and the Holy Spirit if our ethics line up with the Word of God. Refusing to go the way of the world, using floating ethics in every arena of life, regardless of the consequences. You know, number two, to be careful not to be duped by a deceiving world in these last days. You know, since the Bible says that there's a, there will be a falling away in those times, you know, where this, there's this seducing spirit causing people to disconnect from those moral standards and absolute truths that we as a culture once held dear. You know, my question is, is there a stance that you have taken on a subject um, that you that may not agree with scripture I know I have I know that there are things like ideas that I kind of just pluck out of the out of the air because they sound good but then when I match them with scripture it just doesn't make sense you know have thoughts begun to creep in um, that cause me to wonder if the Bible might be out of date you know I think it's it's to our advantage when we ask these questions not just go along with the whole Sunday school teaching on everything in life because when 
the rubber hits the road and we meet trouble and uh, begun, began, begin to ask the serious questions, well, what are we going to lean to on, lean on? The, those things are not rooted down deep in a very convicting way. You know, once the pressure comes, we'll, we'll, we'll break. You know, and you can feel that temptation. You know, like I, I feel that temptation when you, you see what the Bible says, but then you also see what culture says. You know, it, it, comes them, it comes from this place to try and stay relevant. You know, I want to, you know, I kind of want to be in step with culture, but I also want to stay true to God's word. And it just doesn't work. But that temptation is real because you want to kind of like, you know, mold them together. But you don't fully comprehend the fact that, you know, we can't have God's, we can't have God's living presence in us alongside with what the world teaches. And we need to be willing to pay the price for that truth. We need not to be tempted to budge on the truth just to protect our own discomfort. I believe that's another fill in the blank. Pastor Steve told me, you have to have at least five fill in the blanks. I was like, okay, I will do my best. And since Joseph didn't give you guys any last week, I think I thought I gave you uh, three more. So there you go. So then number four, be careful what you allow in through your ears. We need to be able to evaluate ourselves honestly, even if that truth hurts. You know, and the key word there is honestly. You know, when, when we talk about, you know, the, the, that word blasphemo in the Greek, you know, when, it, when you hear foul language or uh, people being blasphemous, slanderous, you know, do you diminish it? Do you pass it off as nothing? Is God pleased by what I'm allowing into my heart, into, in through my ears? And things like gossip could very well fit that category. It doesn't just have to be, you know, these surface level things like, oh, he just said that word. You know, it doesn't have to be that. And number five, be careful what you allow in through your eyes. You know, and this, the story of Lot is a very good example of that. He saw so much wickedness when he lived in Sodom that he became numb and hardened to the evil that his eyes saw continually. His heart became so callous that he wasn't able to live in the midst of that for much longer without giving way to it. It said that God actually had to rescue him from it. He couldn't pull himself out of it. And that's when I, when I talk about the fact that we need to be able to, you know, like that, that temptation to stay relevant, to kind of bring what culture says and what the Bible says together, it just doesn't work. And Lot is a great example of that. Being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and being constantly surrounded by wickedness cannot coexist one is going to drive out the other. You know, Second uh, Peter 2 verse 7 says, But God rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. It said that he was sick. You know, and that really puts it into perspective. You, you might be in a difficult position where you are in life right now. And I, I know for me, you know, I, um, back in the day I, I lived in uh, New York City. And it can be a challenging place, you know, to be in, especially when you work w around people that have very different views than you. And you kind of, you, you genuinely are afraid to speak up. You know, and number six, be careful to spiritually lead your family and your children. We need to be able to ask ourselves, how often do I read the Bible with my family? How often do I pray with my family? Do I take the time to help my family members think through difficult subjects or answers and help them see what the scripture says on the matter instead of what this podcast or, you know, research paper or whatever it might say? What does the Bible say first? You know, and number, number seven, be careful not to give way to a spirit of fear. And I thought, I thought that it was so relevant, uh, you know, as Pastor Zura and um, uh, Dwayne uh, earlier talked about, you know, that's that fear that's gripping people, 
you know, constantly being inundated with the fear in the face of, you know, all that is happening in the world and the culture around us, it's not the correct response. But it can only come from a place where we are proactive with our faith, not reactive. Now, I remember in college, we uh, had this world religions um, class where we were going through all the different religions um, that, you know, kind of like are in the world. And we got to the uh, one of uh, atheism. And the whole point of that class was how we as Christians should respond to each of these different religions. What is it that they claim and how can we then make the counterclaim? How can we then state our case? Then we got to atheism and what was weird to me was we were talking about this specific organization that was kind of, you know, they were they were sending people into, you know, influential churches and, you know, places of influence where Christians, you know, are are actively involved and immediately I had this like, you know, kind of like a retreat almost. I was like, oh no. It's like they found out our secrets. They know that we have, you know, they know that we set up donuts. We, they know that we set up coffee. Like they know that we make sure that the lights are all right. Like all these little things. And, I, and immediately I was like, you're being so stupid right now. Like that is not what it's about. I mean, look at where we are today. I mean, this is, we're not at the Ritz. Like, you know, but, but what is here is God's presence, you know, and that's the thing I, when I was, when I was thinking about it, it was just like, that's so like, why did I even go there? But it was just such a like funny moment for me that I constantly look back at because I, I'm genuine, I'm genuinely serious when I say like, I was like, oh no, like the church is going to go in decline. <laughs> it's just going to go backwards from here. And it's like, that's just so silly. You know, but we can, we all have moments like that in life where we're like, oh, like, and, but you know why? It's because we missed the Holy Spirit in that conversation. No wonder churches retreat or like die out or, you know, are afraid. So they stay relevant with, you know, subjective, you know, truths and things because they don't include the Holy Spirit in what they're doing. And that is our challenge today. You know, and it leads me to another fill in the blank. We need to be proactive in sharing God's truth and light and fight against that fear to step out because of possible backlash. As Christians, we cannot bow to the fear to, to, in the face of fear because of all the darkness that's on the earth. We're called to take that posture that shines light into the darkness. Amen. You know, and one of my favorite verses is in John uh, 1, verse uh, 5. And I like the way that the Amplified puts it. The light shines on in the darkness, and the darkness did not understand it, or overpower it, or appropriate it, or absorb it, and is unreceptive to it. You know, that's a very, like, abstract way of looking at, the, at that verse and, you know, this idea. But to give it a little bit more personality, I think about us being light in dark places how many times have people looked at you in your life they know that there's something different about you but they just don't really know what what what's what's different about you like what is it that is actually different about you and sets you apart you know like someone like Dwayne like how on earth can he smile so much all the time you know like it's amazing you know like faithful people like you know Joe and uh, and Scott you know who bring in you know, these wonderful things for our volunteers, you know, to eat, you know, like uh, all of you. I mean, there's so many things that we do as Christians that make the world think, what is going on? Scratch their heads. They didn't comprehend it. They didn't, over, like, they can't overpower it. When we look at like, you know, the bigger powers in the world, they're going to try to overpower Christianity, push it out of schools, push it, push it out of all these places because they want to drive it out, but they won't be able to. Because the fact of the matter is, they can say no prayer in schools, but you can teach your children prayer is powerful. They can still go to school. They can pray. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's that simple. You know, or they can try and absorb it. It's like, oh, okay, we don't want to completely get rid of you, so we're just going to bring you under this umbrella of darkness, and you can have this little corner. That also doesn't work. 
and it's unreceptive to it. And I love how it starts. It says, the light shines on. How am I becoming an instrument that brings healing and restoration to those who have been hurt by our times? We need to be able to know how to live as Christians in the season that we're in, not the season that we wish to be. This is what God has given us. One of those verses that I always, I, I laugh at it because people don't truly understand what they're saying. You know, you talk about like Esther, for such a time as this. It's like it's so casually used and tossed around, but this is the time. This is your time as the church to step into what God has called you to do. We have unique problems and situations, but God has given us his spirit to overcome those things. Not to, not to you know, cower in fear. Like it says that the light shines on. Like the darkness, you know, it can't touch it. It will try to drive it out, but it won't. You know, we're lo- people are looking for solutions to the deeply embedded, you know, moral dilemmas that they're facing. And they're turning into all, to all different directions and ultimately, in some cases, ruining their lives. But that doesn't have to happen. You know, we're talking about like, you know, end time prophecies and like how terrible the end of the age will be. You know, but just because those things are prophesied doesn't mean that we just have to, you know, oh, sorry, yeah, come through. Like, you don't have, that's, but that's how some Christians live. It's like, oh, yes, that's the stuff they talked about, so I guess we should just let it, let it by. It's like, how, what sense does that make? You know, and as I close, bring up the worship team. I want to remind you guys to not give in to a spirit of fear, but to seize every opportunity to wisely and lovingly speak the truth to those who desperately need your voice. There's the grace element to it, but there's the truth element. God has called us to call things out that are not right, to say that is evil, not good. So why don't you guys stand and we'll, we'll pray. Lord, I thank you for your people here today. Thank you, Father, for your presence in this room. Thank you, Lord, that you are faithful. Lord, you have called us as a church to shine your light into the world. Father, I pray that you will help remind us as we go into our Mondays, our Tuesdays, and onwards, Lord, that you are with us. Help us to invite the Holy Spirit into every area of our life, not just some. And if one of you here today has that struggle of like, how can I be more effective with my faith? You know, if that spirit of fear is ruling your decision making, why don't you lift your hand? Father, I pray for every single one of these people here today who want to be brave, Lord, and to stand for what you say is true, Lord, what your word says is truth. Father, help us to invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, Lord, to speak your truth, to speak your name over every situation. And then I want to pray for a second group of people. You might be here today. You have backslidden. You maybe, you know, have lost your way. Or maybe you're, you know, completely unfamiliar with what Christianity as a whole is all about. But you found yourself here today. And if that's you... I believe that God is calling you home. I believe God is calling you to a new life in him. So if that's you, I want to give you to the count of three. One, or three, two, one. And if that's you today, why don't you raise your hand? Lord, we just thank you. As a church, let's pray this out together. Lord, Forgive me for my sins. I know that I've been wrong. Lord, but I see that you are the truth. 
the way and the life. Lord, I give my heart to you today. Pray, Lord, that I will live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. There we go. Thank you very much, guys. Um, why don't we lead off with a song of worship?